You're listening to The Naked Pravda. This is Medusa's first and only English language podcast, so please don't be shy about recommending us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in. Welcome to another episode of The Naked Pravda. I'm recording this early in the morning on Saturday, August 8th, 2020, and I'm your host, Kevin Rothrock, the managing editor of Medusa's English Language Edition. On today's show, we'll hear from three individuals in Belarus about the presidential election that concludes there on Sunday, August 9th. From a Russian perspective, the most surprising development in this presidential race, which has been uncharacteristically contested this year, is the arrest of 33 Russian nationals who have been identified as mercenaries who probably fought in the Wagner private military company. Officials in Minsk have accused these men of plotting something nefarious, maybe riots, maybe revolution, while Russian diplomats are calling them private security guards, not soldiers of fortune, and insist that they were only passing through Belarus, en route to some other country where they actually had business. So that's all well and good, and we're going to talk about the arrested mercenaries a bit more a bit later. But first, let me run through a few basics of the election, which, as I said, concludes on Sunday, August 9th. The main thing to know is that the two frontrunners appear to be oppositionist challenger Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and longtime incumbent Alexander Lukashenko. And when I say long time, I mean it, because this mustachioed man has been in office since 1994. Take a moment to think about that. 1994. That's the year Forrest Gump and The Mask came out. The Sign by Ace of Bass was the year's top song in the United States. That's also the year Richard Nixon died. That is the last time that Belarus wasn't ruled by Alexander Lukashenko. Anyway... Svetlana Tikhanovskaya is not a career politician. She's running because the authorities refuse to let her husband onto the ballot. Her husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, is a popular YouTuber who built up a massive following over the past year or so by blogging about the red tape that interferes with small businesses and other issues. Tikhanovskaya has the support of the race's two other major candidates who were also refused candidacy. Victor Babariko and Valery Tsipkala, both of whom are now represented by women. In other words, the face of the Belarusian opposition now belongs to three relatively young women. So here we have this uh, trio of rather young women who are campaigning, and they are very visible and present in the public space. And on the other hand, we have a completely different personality. That's Maria Rokova, a doctoral student at the University of Oslo, whose research focuses on nationalism, symbolic politics in post-Soviet autocracies, and identity studies. I asked her about the role of gender in this election, and she said the fact that Tikhanovskaya is a woman is significant, if not in terms of policy, then at another more basic level. Well, I want to see it as an, an important kind of uh, element of this campaign. And I think underestimating or not uh, providing uh, certain a political agency to a woman during this campaign provided an instrument for accumulating these grievances. So all the statement made against women in the campaign provided as well protest potential for other women to unite around a woman. So even though the campaign doesn't really provide, you know, a lot of discussion around gender and gender and politics, it still provides uh, an outlet for supporting a woman, as well kind of motivating other uh, women to engage in politics, to provide them voice and uh, to maybe hear their opinions in this public space. What kind of derogatory comments about women are you talking about? Are there specific things that Lukashenko or someone in his campaign has said during this race? Uh, yes, so I meant that... Uh, I meant there several, several comments. So first it was as a main comment that the constitution was not made for, for a woman. Uh, so that woman cannot be uh, a president in this way, which kind of already provides gender unbalance. So I think this is uh, indicating why the repression 
was directed at male opponents uh, at the very start of the campaign. And it was a bit dismissed at the registration point they, they provided her the opportunity to register as a candidate. So I think this is a very chauvinistic perspective that can be observed in this campaign. And not uh, recognizing that people can unite around a woman is there. Uh, is probably kind of indicates how how his uh, entire circle works and how, and and who is his audience for for this specific comments. So chauvinism uh, in this campaign, I think, uh, was clear indicator that they are a bit outdated in their references and uh, defin- definitely not targeting younger generation. And uh, considering that there are more women in Belarus than men, and uh, this is dismissing a significant, uh, a large majority of electorate you know, with his statements uh, is quite problematic for his campaign. I put the same question to Rikor Astapenia a fellow at Chatham House and the founder and research director of the Center of New Ideas in Belarus. When it comes to women rivals, he says Lukashenko is actually handicapped by his own macho chauvinism. Well, it's easy for him to repress men and males, but at the same time, having an attack against a female, yeah, that sounds very, very odd because he... Uh, created his vision of uh, his image of a high testosterone man who can do anything. But right now it's like pff, repressing a woman. It, it doesn't sound like uh, like an, uh, like for something good for a for, for high testosterone man. I guess it, he really thought it would be easier for him to run against a woman. And on the other hand, it, he perhaps considers it to be unmainly to take repressive actions against her. He makes no secret that he believes that women are inferior to men. On the one hand, he, he believes that it would be easier for him to run against a woman because he really thinks that people have pretty the same thinking that he has, that they are also are pretty sexist, which is currently seems to be not true uh, because Tchanowska gathered very huge protests in across whole Belarus and uh, like in a small city with 18,000 inhabitants I'm in Gliboka right now around 1,000 people just turn out during their weekday, midday protests Franek Vichorka, a journalist in Belarus agrees that the prominence of women in the opposition's campaign against Lukashenko has been a mobilizing factor despite the fact that Svetlana Tikhonovskaya is not exactly a radical feminist. We see grassroots campaign, we see female revolution, which is quite true because women were not so active before and were never on the first rows as, as they are right now. And we see the liberal protest. So basically this revolution is very new and Tikhonovskaya's personality is this symbol of this newness in Belarus politics. However, she herself she is not very liberal and she's not very innovative and modern personality. She's very conservative. Her family is uh, Orthodox. Sergei Tikhanovsky is very a traditional Orthodox guy. But her role is very symbolic. And Tikhanovsky as the symbol is, is filling out with many threads that don't really belong to her. People just put in this, in this box whatever they want. And they see, they see the personality they want to see in the Tikhanovskaya's personality. On August 4th, President Lukashenko gave his annual State of the Nation speech in Parliament, speaking for an unusually brief 90 minutes or so. Observers say he looked sickly, and some say he sounded desperate to convince his audience that he's still the unquestioned popular leader he's claimed to be for the past quarter century. Richard Astapenia was not impressed with Lukashenko's national address. First of all, it was obvious that he is physically ill and it makes people nervous around him because they do not know and understand whether they should really follow his orders to falsify the elections and suppress the protests. I mean, he, of course, he mentioned several times that police and Central Election Commission shouldn't be worried about the protests. But at the same time, you know, if he is seriously ill, so... The substance was weak as well. They made some unrealistic promises, but actually no one really cares about them because everyone understands that 
in this system, with this system, you cannot change anything. You cannot improve your economy. Your GDP will not grow because Belarusian economy is stagnating for the last 10 years. And it was stagnating even like the, during the last 10 years when Russia was subsidizing Belarusian economy. But right now, as Belarus have no energy subsidies and uh, when Belarusian products have problems to access Russian markets. So it seems obvious that Belarusian economy will not grow. But of course, the pandemic also will have its impact on the economy. So they, of course, say that the Belarusian economy will grow twice in five years, but actually no one really listen to that because it's too obvious that actually Belarusian economy will be stagnating for the next five years. He used it as an opportunity of kind of promoting his uh, kind of electoral campaign. So uh, on the same day, they also posted his uh, electoral campaign in the one of their state newspapers, state control newspapers. So in this way, he was trying as well to, to create a big splash and put himself on the spotlight because I think the previous weeks, he was a bit of out of the spotlight. Some other people occupy this. So in this moment, I think on this day, he wanted to attract the significant attention to himself and to provide a stronger response to people who would consider his main electorate. Does he have much support left? Like, are, does he still have a base of mains of people? Or I do think that he has a base. So it's I think it's kind of wrong to dismiss that he stayed in power, you know, for 26 years. His base is still there. So if we go deeper into this, we can, you know, qualify who those people are, but it's definitely people who are, who support the entire kind of administrative system of how this uh, regime function, they are there and they will be voting for him. So dismissing them would be uh, completely wrong. Franek Vichorka listened to Lukashenko's speech too, and he thinks the president sounds a bit stuck in a bygone era. It was not the speech of the victor, it was the speech of uh, someone who is begging for a pardon, someone who is begging for another chance. It was something like he was trying to explain why he did so and why he did that, why he treated COVID in this way and not in another way, why he stopped privatization and uh, why it was important in 90s. He was constantly back into 90s. I think he feels the same as, as he felt right, right there. In, in 95, 96, when the group of parliamentarians were trying to impeach him. But we don't see anything which will look like a split in the elites. We don't see that any policemen or generals will flip the sides and will support the opposition. But we see Lukashenko, he's very uncertain about his future. And even if he will uh, stay in power after August 9, even if he, if he will kill people with tanks and armor vehicles, I am sure that it, this will be his last uh, presidential term. He feels that. Everyone in the room felt that. The only question is when this transition will begin, will it be peaceful? Will it be violent? Will it be long? Or will it be flash? So this is the question I don't have answer because too many variables, too many factors that nobody, nobody can predict. Why is he so concerned about, and why are you so convinced that this will be his last term if there are, are not members of the elite that are willing to back an opposition candidate? If that remains the same, why can't Lukashenko just serve until his dying day? First of all, his model of governance is like a popular authoritarianism or authoritarian populism, and he needs the popular support in order to keep system going. So the social contract you know, which, which sounds very theoretical for all the countries in the world, it's very relevant to the Belarus situation because perhaps that's the only country where a social contract exists and where, where it really works. And many people suffered, you know, and have given their independence, freedom, democratic rights to Lukashenko in exchange for security guarantees and for some stability and some clarity regarding the future. Now Lukashenko is not popular enough to keep this social contract going, and he is not a quick and dynamic uh, politician enough to keep all the moves between elites smooth. Before 2015, he was trying to manage elites, ministers, to appoint them by himself, 
to choose personalities, you know, and to give orders, to decide on politics of each ministry. Now he just trying to manage the flaws within the system. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Belarusian security officials arrested 33 Russian nationals outside Minsk on July 29th. The men are allegedly mercenaries in the Wagner Private Military Company, an outfit reportedly controlled by the Russian oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin with a history of operations in Syria, Northern Africa, Venezuela, and Eastern Ukraine. Since announcing the arrest to the world, Lukashenko has been on the phone with both Russian President Putin and Ukrainian President Zelensky. Both leaders would like the detainees extradited to their countries. Like nearly anyone who's being honest with you, Rika Rastapenia says he isn't quite sure what to make of this whole controversy. Actually, that's also a very odd situation because his accusations are very serious. And he's saying that they were trying to destabilize Belarus. So it's very serious accusations. And I think it's very important for Russia. And they are very nervous about his statements and they are thinking how they should react. But generally, I think the main reason behind these accusations are very emotional because Lukashenko has no financial support from Russia right now. And uh, it puts him in a very difficult position because he doesn't know what to do with the Belarusian economy. He doesn't know what to do what to do next. Because the whole Belarusian political and economic system was built on the fact that Russia was paying like 10-50% of Belarusian GDP each year in uh, by energy subsidies, by selling us oil and gas on uh, lower prices. But right now we don't have that. And it's a huge question what then we should do. It's like the whole economy was built, built on that, you know, so that's why he thinks that Russia is really trying to dethrone him. And actually, these relations between uh, Russia and Belarus, they were spoiled. They were spoiled not just like today, this year, but they were actually spoiled like from 2014 when uh, Lukashenko didn't support Russia's attacks against Ukraine. And then uh, Russia tried to force him to have a Russian air base based in Belarus, but Lukashenko rejected it. After that, Russians tried to create or recreate the union state between Belarus and Russia, because it's probably it was one of the ideas for Putin to stay in power after 2024. And so that's why these relations were spoiled for the last six years. And uh, it's very, very nervous for Lukashenko and for Russia as well. And I really think that right now R- Russians are really nervous and thinking how should they react because such accusations are just like, it's too much. Maria Rokhova notes that Lukashenko has been careful not to criticize Putin and the Kremlin directly when talking about these mercenaries which is pretty remarkable, given that he's accusing combatants from Russia of coming to Belarus with plans of revolution and election meddling. They don't really point a finger at Kremlin, so they don't point a finger at the ruling authorities. They point a finger somewhere at Russia. doesn't matter where, just somewhere Russia. So basically those are Russian mercenaries represent somehow some kind of figure in Russia. So this is why probably... We can't really say that it really damages this kind of interaction between the ruling authority in Russia and Belarus. Frenik Vichorka has noticed the same restraint on Lukashenko's part when he talks about the mercenaries. It's weird, he says. I don't understand why Lukashenko speaks about this uh, such softly. You know, he say, yeah, but we shouldn't uh, treat them badly. They're just mercenaries. They just work for big guys. You know, if you arrest criminals, if you arrest bandits, you know, killing people worldwide, you don't say that, oh, but, you know, it's not their fault. You know, they're just like small kids. And he behaves exactly, you know, like like the father who, who caught like six years boy, you know, <laughs> you know, by, 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 I don't know, punishing his cat. With 
so much that feels new about this presidential race in Belarus, particularly the apparent strength of Svetlana Tikhonovskaya's campaign. The natural question you're surely asking yourself right now, as the end of voting approaches, is, you know, what happens next? Opposition campaign workers themselves have told journalists that they expect to lose the race to election falsification. And the experts I spoke to for this podcast also said Lukashenko's victory is the likeliest outcome. But there's a sense that his next re-election would be even harder, if not impossible. How this term begins will depend largely on the size of the protests that erupt when election officials announce Tikhonovskaya's defeat. I can imagine how will be their frustration when uh, their favorite candidate will get 5% of support officially, and uh, when they will understand that they are cheated, they are manipulated, they are lied so heavily, I think they will go out, they will go to streets. And this is, will be the real electoral campaign. That will be the real voting day. The number of people who will protest to protect their votes. What if the final tally is not 5% to 80% or whatever? What if the, the final tally looks a lot closer, but they still give it to Lukashenko? I don't believe in that at all. You know, Lukashenko, he needs to show his multiple lead, multiple advantage in contrast to all other. This is why he kept at the race all the smaller candidates just for good picture, just for good infographics, just to show, you know, that this is his rating and this is their rating. Frannik holds his hands out wide and then brings them closely in together. And in, uh, when he used this contrast, you know, he, he always looks better. Brijo Rastepeña says the biggest consequence of Sunday's election will be the political crisis it sparks in the years to come. Lukashenko will surely welcome another term in office, he says, but it won't be much fun. If we talk about protests, I guess they will be crowdy, but at the same time, police will beat or arrest many people. It's very difficult to imagine that, for example, 200,000 people will flood the streets. So my guess is that they will be able to handle a crowd. I mean, the police. And, and after that, after that it, I guess Belarus will have a huge political crisis because it's obvious right now that it will be obvious for everyone in the country that Lukashenko falsified elections, that he beat people who were real peace protesters. So majority of Belarusians will probably hate him for doing that. I guess it would be a very serious thing for election commissions and police officers because, well, they will be hated as well. So I expect that the level of polarization in Belarus after the election will be uniquely high. Although even now the people's resentment towards the state officials is very, very high. Maria Rokova says Lukashenko will need to agree to new compromises if he wants to hold on to power. Whether he likes it or not, these concessions will bring about restructuring that could finally lead to changes in Belarus. No matter what, it still weakens this kind of institutional structure of the regime that is there. So the regime which was able to survive on the small coalition, on, on this myth of popular legitimacy, is, not, is no longer there. And I think it weakens the entire institutional structure of how the regime functions. And the next five years, it will really have to rethink how the structure will actually work further and how this coalition, ruling coalition, will work. Because they will definitely demand certain kind of compromises from their presidency. And then the, the, this kind of pre presents a challenge for, for, the, for the regime, I would say. This is quite uh, interesting to see how this will unfold. You've been listening to The Naked Pravda, an English-language podcast from Medusa. On today's show, we heard from three experts on Belarusian politics about the August 9th presidential election. Hopefully you managed to listen to this episode before the voting finished. If not, I wonder how well our guest prognostications panned out. The Naked Pravda is a podcast from Medusa. It's our first language, language language. It's our first English-language show, and I hope you recommend us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in to help put this program in front of more people. Thanks for listening and come back soon. Mm -hmm.